This is producer Julie Sabatier, just letting you know that this episode references sexual assault, harassment, and domestic abuse. So my name is Sasha Takshablu Lapointe. Sasha Takshablu Lapointe grew up in the 1980s and 90s on the Swinomish Reservation in Washington State. As a child, she had three cassette tapes that she played over and over again. It was the best of Blondie, Madonna's Like a Virgin, and Janet Jackson, just the Janet album. Those are like the first femme like musicians that I fell in love with. And I remember like walking around in the woods behind the trailer that we lived in in Swinomish, like with my little headphones and my tapes. Those tapes left her with a very specific idea of what it meant to be a woman in the music industry. They were very glamorous and beautiful. And like, I remember at a young age being like, okay, so to play music, you have to have this like sugary, sweet voice, this sort of pop voice and presentation. I remember finding that odd. A few years later, when LaPointe was 13, she tuned into the college radio station and heard Bikini Kill for the first time. Since we lived out in the middle of the woods, there wasn't a ton to do. And I used to drag this crappy little Sony boombox into the trailer's small bathroom just to get away from my siblings and have that little safe space. And I remember the first couple of songs I heard during that time was White Boy, Star Bellied Boy, and Double Daria. And up until that point, I hadn't heard anyone talk about the things that I had experienced, um, let alone sing about them, like things like sexual assault. And I just remember being really shook um, when I heard Kathleen Hanna's voice go from this like sing-song, kind of girl-like sweetness into this guttural screeching. All the while, like the content and the lyrics of like what she was singing about just really connected to me. And I have this visceral memory of like hugging my knees to my chest and feeling really overwhelmed by it, like in all ways, like I felt really connected to it. I felt really understood. I felt less alone. I was like, oh my gosh, like I I was so overwhelmed that I was crying, but like also at the same time, like, wow, where has this been my whole life? That experience unlocked something for LaPointe. Unfortunately, sexual violence and domestic abuse are really common in reservation communities. And um, I had seen the impact of that specific violence firsthand. And So when I heard this music and connected to these lyrics and everything that I heard about that was going on, it felt like this wake up call, like, oh, wait, we don't have to accept this. We can fight this. Like, we can be angry. According to a national study from 2018, 81% of women reported experiencing some form of sexual harassment and or assault. It's difficult to find a comparable number from the 90s, especially because sexual harassment was not understood in the same way then as it is now. But it's safe to say that there were countless girls like Sasha LaPointe who felt a connection to Riot Girl because of their personal experiences with sexual abuse and domestic violence. The DIY spirit of Riot Girl gave women and girls space to create their own version of feminism. For some, that meant taking action in their own lives. At 14, I started leaving home a lot and then eventually emancipated myself um, and got, I remember my first apartment when I was 15, it was with like eight other kids, like eight other people in this two bedroom apartment in Mount Vernon, Washington. Um, So that was like my first punk house. Women were taking matters into their own hands in a new way. They were making connections with each other through zines, music and Riot Girl meetings. And at the same time, They were exposing sexual violence and harassment as systemic issues. As more and more women felt empowered both collectively and individually, they faced pushback from mainstream culture and even within punk scenes. I'm Fabi Reina, founder of She Shreds Media, and this is Starting a Riot. What comes to mind when you hear the phrase girl power? As someone who was born in the 90s, it sounds pretty cheesy to me. It doesn't feel powerful, and it makes me think of, like, bachelorette decorations sold at Walmart. And of course, I think of the Spice Girls. Want, really, really want. So really, really want. 
As far as we know, the first time Girl Power was written down was on the cover of the Bikini Kill zine in 1991. That's how drummer Toby Vale remembers it. At the time, it seemed really interesting to put those two words together, like girl and power, you know, because it seemed like two opposites coming together. I was like, well, what if we brought those two words together and like, what would that be? It was the second issue of that zine, the one that contained the Riot Girl manifesto. We are angry at a society that tells us girl equals dumb. Girl equals bad. Girl equals weak. Because I believe. I believe. I believe with my whole heart, mind, body that girls constitute a revolutionary soul force that can. And will change the world for real. For real. Like Riot Girl songs, the ideas in the manifesto were both empowering to girls and women and threatening to existing power structures. We're bikini kill, and we want revolution! Girls don't know! Hey, girls, friend! I got a proposition, go something like this! Tell you to do what you want! Tell you to be who you will! Tell you to cry right out loud! You got so emotional, baby! Vail says Double Daria was one of the first songs the band wrote together just talking through politics and things that were affecting their lives. A lot of times when, at the beginning when Kathleen would write songs, like some of it was like we'd stayed up late the night before and then like the next day she'd written this song like that had stuff that we talked about in it, you know. So it just, it was very exciting. And, and I just, I really, I do really love that song. When Bikini Kill said Revolution Girl style now, it was an invitation. You know, when you see like all the footage of the Beatles and you see the girls screaming in the audience or you see like Madonna concert and there's all the girls screaming in the audience. Like I remember having the thought of what if we got those girls screaming in the audience to actually start a revolutionary subculture of young feminists and, you know, get them to all start bands. Throughout the 90s, girl power went from an underground punk growl to a sugary, sweet, less aggressive version of feminism. The Spice Girls focused on female friendship. If you want to be my lover, you got to get with my friends. Make it last forever. Friendship never ends. The Spice Girls used vaguely empowering language, saying girls and women should control their own destiny and take control of their lives. At the same time, these pop stars embraced mainstream beauty standards and capitalism. The tall and slender Spice Girl dolls were the best-selling celebrity dolls of all time. The first collection was, of course, called Girl Power. Bikini Kill wasn't willing to sign to a major label, though. And musicians who take the stage with words like slut written on their bodies are not exactly commercially viable. Historian and Girls to the Front author Sarah Marcus says that, in certain ways, Riot Girl was still appealing to mainstream tastemakers. The major labels realized that angry girls sell records and happy, encouraging girls who are friends with each other sell records. And so then you got, on the one hand, like Alanis Morissette as the angry girl. And on the other hand, you got the Spice Girls as the happy, encouraging girls who are friends with each other. And they did indeed sell records. It's entirely possible that without Riot Girl, there would be no Spice Girls. And Marcus says that there's room for both. When my book came out, I gave a talk and uh, I had this room full of gender studies majors who were like, what do you think of the Spice Girls? I was like, well, did you all listen to the Spice Girls growing up? And they were like, oh, yes. And I was like, and y'all are gender studies majors now? Oh, yes. And I was like, well, how, you know, how can I, how can I say bad things about the, the Spice Girls? Like, obviously, it's a completely watered down version of what Riot Girl was, and at the same time, it's an entry point. The commodification of girl power and even girl anger did make it more accessible to more women, but it also separated it from feminist politics and obscured the very real threats that young women faced. Coming up after a break, we'll hear how Riot Girls fought against sexism within punk. Alison Wolf of Bratmobile was raised by a second-wave feminist. Her mom, Pat Shively, opened the first women's health clinic in the county that's home to Olympia, Washington. Abortion was one of the services offered there, 
and that meant that Shively and her family lived with threats from anti-abortion activists. Wolf remembers that her mom regularly wore a bulletproof vest to work. People sometimes threw rocks at our windows or house. I remember that. Um, one time someone tried to, it, looked, it seemed like they tried to set fire to our front door. It didn't really work. Um, one time all the pets were poisoned of uh, everyone who worked at the clinic. I mean, you know, who knows, but everyone came to work on Monday and they'd all had to be at the emergency vet. And so they think that that's probably what happened. People were really threatened by her. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, Allison Wolf embraced her mom's fearlessness. But she also felt a strong need to pursue her own version of feminism. She was able to do that with Riot Girl. Wolf met Molly Newman at the University of Oregon, and the two of them started the band Bratmobile and the zine called Girl Germs. We wanted our feminism to be maybe more DIY punk, less academic, and we wanted our punk worlds to be more feminist and also we wanted to be on the stage we're so cool yeah 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 we're so cool cool we're so cool yeah yeah fuck you too cool schmuck. like her mom allison wolf found plenty of people were threatened by her feminism she remembers an incident from bratmobile's second show in olympia when they opened for a seattle band called the melvins she says Bikini Kill lead singer Kathleen Hanna was up front cheering them on. And when we got off stage, I remember Kathleen coming up to me and saying, hey, are you guys okay? Are you all right? And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, I mean, we just opened for the Melvins. I feel great. And she was like, oh, no, because guys were yelling death threats at you the whole time. <laughs> so uh, I didn't know that. The threats from within were very real. Riot girl bands tried to create safe spaces for people who came to their shows by shouting out girls to the front. The idea was to make space for women who wanted to dance close to the stage and to create a barrier of protection for the women on stage as well. Team Dresh, another band from Olympia, would teach self-defense workshops before their shows. In the 80s and 90s, white supremacist skinheads threatened to take over punk scenes in the Pacific Northwest and elsewhere. Anti-racists within the scene fought back, but Toby Vale says sometimes it was just hard to tell what kind of threat they were facing when guys at shows would start yelling. We didn't know. Are they like neo-Nazis? Are they racist skinheads? Are they going to try and kill us? You know, like that kind of stuff. Vale says that unfortunately, safety at shows is still an issue. Bikini Kill has been on a reunion tour over the past couple of years, and they played a show in Tucson the night the news leaked that Roe vs. Wade was likely to be overturned. We were all very upset, and we went out to play the show, and while we were playing, someone who was there to see us was assaulted in the audience, and we were told about the assault right after it happened, and Kathleen, you know, had to... Um, stop it basically and we we're trying to get the guy kicked out and then no one could find him and then another incident that happened like shortly after that was someone got thrown out of one of our shows for allegedly messing with audience members and they waited afterwards for us and tried to run over one of our crew members with a car despite these kinds of incidents Vale says that what bikini kill is doing on stage still feels incredibly important we haven't added any new material to our live sets. We still haven't even learned all of the songs that we want to learn from our back catalog. So, you know, we're doing the same songs and <laughs> unfortunately they still are very relevant. She's focused on ways to make it easier for young people to create their own culture outside of corporate control. She says that's even more important now than it was in the early nineties. Society's at a critical point, like, you know, with the fundamentalist right wing, the rise of fascism, neo-Nazis, that's like all mainstream, like the stuff that we were dealing with that shows in the early 90s, that's happening like to the culture at large. Some of the ideas that Riot Girl championed have also gone mainstream. The Me Too movement offered women a new way to talk about systemic sexual harassment and abuse. Missing and murdered indigenous women is a movement to raise awareness about the disproportionate number of Native women facing violence. And speaking out about subjects like sexual assault or abortion is no longer relegated to subversive subcultures like punk. The day after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, Grammy-winning pop star Olivia Rodrigo took the stage at the Glastonbury Music Festival before an enormous cheering crowd. 
She dedicated a song called Fuck You to the five conservative justices responsible for the decision. Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, Neil Gorsuch, Amy Conan Barrett, and Brett Kavanaugh. We hate you. We hate you. Riot Girl was focused on making space for women to connect and collaborate with one another. As a musician, I understand the therapeutic effects that live music can have on people. The connection that people feel to the lyrics and the vibration of the music and the actual physical energy that's created in that space. It can be life-changing, and it means that performers have to hold space for themselves and their fans. Toby Vale remembers that sexual assault survivors like Sasha LaPointe were drawn to Riot Girl. She says fans would get vulnerable with lead singer Kathleen Hanna at shows. To her credit, she had like crisis counseling training and she would try to talk to them. She tried to talk to all of them, but that was like really hard on her. Like she couldn't get them all to a safe place, right? Um, Or find them a place to live that was free from violence. So She tried to get them to meet each other and support each other and build community by encouraging them to start Riot Girl chapters in their own town. Riot Girl chapters varied from place to place. Some made zines, some were more focused on music, but most of them held regular meetings. The meetings started in Washington, D.C. and Olympia in the summer of 1991 and were spread to dozens of cities around the U.S., as well as Canada and the U.K., These were spaces where young women could gather and talk about their own experiences with sexism, sexual assault, and other struggles they were facing. I absorbed all of it and felt like that was part of my sort of political awakening. Raquel Gutierrez attended Riot Girl meetings in L.A. I was maybe 15 because I didn't drive myself there. I was always going with another teenage friend who drove us in her, I think it was a geostorm. Sometimes the meetings were held in public spaces, like the basement of a coffee shop. And Gutierrez remembers going to at least one meeting in someone's apartment. It felt like we had walked into a scene of a girl older than us, just on the verge of tears. You know, just whatever traumatic experience she had been narrating. I I don't know the details. You can imagine those details. A story about being harassed at school or at work, sexual abuse or coercion self-harm, witnessing or being the victim of domestic abuse? It was, it was tense. It was a tense scene to walk into. There was no moderation, no facilitation, nobody sort of posing questions. It just was kind of a, a wild, wild west of, uh, of shared trauma. Gutierrez remembers that these personal stories were mixed in with political topics that also came up in the meetings. And the politics were really powerful because I did want to know about what is the history of Roe v. Wade? Why is uh, abortion still up for debate? You know, why are women being hunted? Why are women being uh, raped and murdered? Gutierrez ended up starting a band called Tummy Ache and a zine called Soda Jerk. They only attended a few meetings, but they felt like it made them a part of something bigger. Sasha LaPointe didn't have access to Riot Grrrl meetings, but she started discovering more bands and she also found zines. Seeing these zines and kind of consuming these these images and these powerful things, like I remember seeing one about self-defense or how to get home safely. And as an adult, I can look back on that and I, I wish that something like that had taken root in my like Native community. LaPointe found older kids who would take her to punk shows and she started making her own zines. I grew up on the reservation. I went to alternative high school and dropped out in uh, my junior year. And so I feel like other writing spaces could feel intimidating and did feel intimidating to someone like me. And so seeing the sort of DIY spirit of zines and, and punk music sort of affirmed for me or gave me permission to like be like, oh, you can do this anyway. You don't have to like come from this strong academic background. Um, You can just write, you can just make the thing, do the poem, like make a zine by yourself. And that was really liberating for me. And I think that without that, I'm not sure I would have ever felt confident enough to pursue writing like much later in life. You know, my life would probably look a lot different. LaPointe is now a published author. Her memoir came out in 2022. It's called Red Paint, the ancestral autobiography of a Coast Salish punk. 
She also shares her poetry on stage as part of the Seattle band Medusa Stare. Her new book of poetry, Rose Quartz, actually started as a zine that she made to take on tour with the band. Drink me and see the morning my grandmother walked into the sea. Drink and see me beneath a stranger and thrashing. See red party cups ringing my head. But even with everything she got from Riot Girl, her relationship with the movement is still complicated. Riot Girl happened here on Coast Salish territory, and to my knowledge, there wasn't a single Coast Salish fronted band out of that entire movement. And I think that just in general, you know, Riot Girl kind of opening up this gateway into DIY punk and wanting to like seek out those spaces. Um, I remember as I grew older, I definitely started to notice how like the whiteness of these spaces too, even in just like little venues or basement shows in Seattle, I was really drawn to what was happening. But I also, I, I just remember taking note and starting to ask myself, like, where are the other native punks? Do they even exist? And that's a really lonely kind of feeling. Like where are the Coast Salish Riot Girls. Raquel Gutierrez definitely noticed that Riot Girl didn't seem to include everyone in their community either. It wasn't the most diverse space, but there was definitely Filipina women, there was Latinas, there weren't any Black women, and it was a lot of white women. Gutierrez says that the whiteness of the scene felt limiting to them. I think even in as a teenager, I just knew that there was a certain limitation in solidarity And I just didn't feel like I could, you know, feel trustful of white girls in in the scene to a degree. What Raquel is saying makes a lot of sense to me. For as much as the movement changed my life, I have a complicated relationship with Riot Girl and with feminism, too. Of course, I believe in equality across the gender spectrum, but there's something about the culture of feminism that feels very binary and white. For me, it's never really felt like home, even though it's supposed to. In the next episode, we dig deeper into the experiences of people like me, who felt the connection to Riot Girl, but also felt like the movement wasn't exactly for them. We'll talk about the missed opportunities to be more inclusive and what that means for the Riot Girl legacy. I felt that it was a space for white women or non-Black women, I should say, because anti-Black racism is a whole different beast. It's not like Riot Girl was like anti-queer, but it didn't feel specifically queer in the way that I just, that's what I needed at that time. The aesthetic was like um, maybe baby doll dresses and uh, barrettes and stuff, which is wonderful, except not, that's not my, that's not my jam. And then it also, I think the, like the politic of it felt more um, straight for a lack of a better word. Being Black, it's a marginalized identity that's put upon you. So you're naturally have an affinity to punk. Like, Black people are just naturally punk. Starting a Riot is brought to you by Oregon Public Broadcasting and She Shreds Media. Thanks to all the members who make podcasts possible at OPB. This podcast is hosted by me, Fabi Reina. Julie Sabatier produced this podcast, and I'm going to hand the first part of these credits over to her. The songs you heard in this episode were White Boy and Double Daria by Bikini Kill, Sneaking Into Your House by Emily Sassy Lime, Cool Schmool by Bratmobile, and Magic by The Linda Lindas. Thank you to the band members and to Terror Bird and Kill Rockstars for allowing us to use those songs. You can find a playlist on our website, opb.org slash starting a riot. You should also go out, buy the music, and support the artists. Our editor for this project is Sage Van Wing. Our theme music is composed by Ray Ags. Listen to their solo projects and their bands, Trash Kit, Shopping, and Sacred Paws. Our sound engineers are Nalene Silva and Stephen Cray, all mixing and mastering by Stephen Cray. Thanks to Ryan Haas, Anna Griffin, Donald Orr, and Prakruti Bot for their listening ears. Also, thanks to JT Griffith and the team at Liminal Music for their help with music rights. Thanks to our Riot Girl Manifesto readers, Dina Barnwell, Jen Chavez, and Prakruti Bhatt. The other songs you heard in this episode were Wannabe by the Spice Girls, Fuck You by Lily Allen, sung by Lily Allen and Olivia Rodrigo, and Poison Garden 2 by Medusa Stare. If you like our podcast, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review. It helps people find us. 